All right. Good morning, Lifeway Church. God is good. Now the time. All right. So glad that you're here today. Hope you're ready to go. Some of you got your Bible. Some of you have your Bibles on your phone. I believe when God speaks to you, you want to underline or take notes. You don't want to miss it. Sometimes we can forget. I know God said something. But if you're online with us, we're so glad that you're joining us today. We believe uh, you're not there by chance or you're not here by chance, but you're here for a very specific reason. I, I believe that there's something happens when you show up and position yourself with the presence of the Lord. There's an exchange. You come in with some things. He takes some things. He gives you things, sends you back out. Amen. Aren't you glad that God's a God that exchanges things in our life? Amen. So, so I, I got a question for you. Are you a follower of Christ, a disciple of Christ, or are you both? Think about it. Are you both? Are you both? You see, Jesus had both in the Bible. He had followers and he had disciples. And the Greek word for disciples, mathetes. Everybody say mathetes. I just probably taught you how to say it wrong, but I just wanted you to join me in saying a word wrong. Suckers. All right, here we go. This is what mathetes means. Mathetes means a pupil or apprentice, one who is following, learning, and everybody say emulating. Because if you're a disciple, you should be emulating what Jesus did. Amen. When you spend time with Jesus, you'll begin to think like him and talk like him, right? Have you ever noticed, have you ever drifted away from the Lord, you get busy, and pretty soon you find, you'll start talking like the world? See, who you stay closest to is who you begin to emulate the most, amen? Disciples emulate Jesus. So we're continuing this series. This is week two of discipleship, okay? We are in training mode. I believe we're in training mode because disciples always train. I, I would suggest this to us that, we need to stay in training mode all the way till we walk into heaven, right? Because you're constantly learning and growing how to be a stronger disciple. We're training mode. Training with a purpose, right? We just don't train for no reason. We train with a purpose. Our purpose is really simple, to be a disciple and make more disciples. We're training with a purpose, be a disciple, make more disciples. You see, when Jesus went around and he preached the good news everywhere, right? News of the kingdom of God there were thousands of people that followed Jesus. You read the scriptures, thousands followed him. They were entertained by his miracles. They were in awe of his teaching. Where did he get his knowledge? They didn't quite understand that he was the son of God, right? But they were just followers. Only a few really became disciples, right? Only a few became disciples. Most were just followers. So here are some traits. I put down three traits of a follower of Jesus, not a disciple, but just a follower. Because I believe we have to be both. We follow and we get discipled by Jesus. A trait, here's trait number one. A follower listens to great teaching, but rarely puts that teaching into practice. Number two, a follower likes to sit and watch instead of listening and then doing. And a follower is in it for the benefits. A disciple follows out of obedience. Why? Because Jesus said, be a disciple and go make disciples. Amen? All right. Now, theologian John Piper, raise your hand if you've heard of this theologian, John Piper. Some of you understand. John Piper's written a lot of stuff. Here's one of his quotes. I wrote it down. The most important word I think Jesus ever said about becoming a disciple, he says in Luke chapter 14, verse 27. So I looked it up. Here it is. This is a different version. It's the Amplified Version. It says, whoever does not carry his own cross, expressing a willingness to endure whatever may come and follow after me, Believing in me and conforming to my example in living and, if, it, if need be, suffering or perhaps dying because of faith in me cannot be my disciple. You see, bearing the cross means dying to your old self all the time. Dying to your old desires, that's really hard, isn't it? Dying to your old attitude. You ever find yourself getting an attitude problem back, right? That's our flesh. Our flesh is going to follow us into heaven. We make our flesh submit to the Holy Spirit that's in us. Amen? But bearing our cross means we are going to follow Jesus no matter what. No matter what. Jesus tells us of our main assignment, our main mission, right? Here's your main assignment from Jesus. It's in Matthew 28. This is Jesus talking. He says, therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples. Everybody say, Teach these new disciples, new disciples, to obey all the commands, right, I have given you. And be sure of this, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. You ever felt like Jesus wasn't with you, right? He's always with you. 
He's always with you. But I love what he said right here. He's talking to Christians. He's talking to regular Christians. They don't have superpowers. They're regular Christians, right? And they've, these Christians, you know, these disciples, they've been following Jesus for a little over three years. Scriptures, you know, theologians think about three years. That's how long that these Christians had spent with Jesus. And Jesus turns to them and he says, here's your main assignment. Be a disciple and I need you to go make disciples. And that's what he's speaking to us today. You know, scripture is not just for back then. It's for now in our lives. Amen. So we're applying these scriptures to our lives. So what's it mean? It's not sharing the gospel because there's a difference, right? I'm, I'm sharing the gospel. Being a disciple and making more disciples is simply what Jesus did with his disciples. He walked alongside them. He encouraged them, right? Often had to bring corrective. Remember Peter? He, he, he corrected Peter quite a bit, right? He uh, encouraged them discipled them, spent time with them, and that's what Jesus is asking us. Who in your life, who's in your area of influence, right? Not only do you not need to share the gospel, but you also need to disciple, walk alongside them, helping them get stronger, amen, and stronger. That's what God says. Aren't you glad that when you were a young disciple, someone encouraged you, spoke into your life, and helped you? And that's what, that's what Jesus is saying. Do for others what I've done for you over the last three years, Okay. So today's message is titled, You Are Valuable. You Are Valuable. We're going to look at how valuable you are and how much the Lord loves you. You see, when we receive the fullness of God's love in our lives, right, we're going to function from a place of his love, and you don't have to earn his love. You see, the devil loves for you to feel like you have to fit in. You've got to do a little more before you can fit in and be loved by Jesus. Jesus is saying, I love you so much, and I'm going to share some scriptures how much he loves you, right? But you function from a place of love, not trying to earn God's love. Super important, because if we don't get this as disciples, we'll be trying to earn our way for Jesus' approval and love in our lives when he, you are, he's already given it to us. Amen? Super important. I think too often, young Christians and older Christians, we disqualify ourselves from being a disciple based on how good we've been. Do you know that? That you're not qualifies as a disciple by your good behavior, you're qualified by the blood of Jesus in your, your life and over your life. Amen. That's good news for us. Okay. But we got to be able to receive the fullness of God's love in our lives because identity is huge. You guys understand identity is so big. Jesus tells us throughout scripture, here's who you are. Here's how I see you. Right now, our identity is big because if you don't know who you are, how can you really know what to do? If you don't believe that you're loved by God, Right? How can you really love others like God? Identity is huge. You've got to know who you are so you know how to love. You've got to know how you're loved so you can, you can love other people, even people that maybe bother you or don't treat you right. So identity is huge. And I, I believe there's two value systems. You've got the value system that's in the Word of God, the only ones that disciples should listen to, amen? But we live in a world that's a fallen world, and we see things on social media, we hear other things. We might have a boss at work that says things to us, or maybe we're at school and a teacher or some friends, they say stuff to us. There's a world system, and there's a biblical system that brings value to our lives. So i got to bring some definition to this, because it's super important. If we want to be the disciples God's calling us to be, we got to make sure we stay in the right category of what God says about us. Amen. The devil's always wanting to slap labels on us, discourage us, disqualify us, and it's called the, the worldview, okay? So I'm going to break some of this down, these two view si value systems, and um, I got the first one for us is, is this, how does God value you? How does God value you, okay? So David writes this, he, he, this is, remember this is for us, penned through the Holy Spirit, through David, here we go, David writes in Psalm 139, he says this, I will praise you for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. David's saying, I know I got issues, but man, I'm wonderfully made. I, I will fear you, Lord. Marvelous are your works and that my soul knows very well. How precious also are your thoughts to me, O God. How great is the sum of them. If I sh should count them, they would be more in number than the sand. When I awake, I am still with you. David is reminding us in scripture right there, how precious God's thoughts are back towards David. How precious God's thoughts. He said the sum of them. Like, see, I mean, God has great thoughts about you. Isn't that good? Right? Isn't that good? That God has great thoughts about us. This is what the Lord says in Isaiah 49. He says this. See, I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. 
Your walls are ever before me. Go ahead and leave that up there, Ryan. Engraved you on the palms of my hand. So have you ever written something on your hand so you don't forget because it's super important? Got to drop this bill off, man. I got to get this bill turned in. Super important. You, didn't, you just wrote it, but you didn't engrave it. Jesus is saying, you're so valuable to him, he has engraved your name on his hands. Picture this, picture Jesus, right? When he looks down and he sees his hands, he's reminded of you. He loves you so much that he's written your name in his, on the palm of his hand. He looks down, he sees you, and he loves you. He's in love with you, right? Now the walls, they, they symbolize something else. Think about when you read scripture in the Bible, walls always represented security and protection, right? When the Israelites got attacked by the enemy, they would try to tear down the wall because they wanted them to feel helpless. Right? That was their intention. Plus, the enemy could get in any time they want and steal whatever they want. Jesus is saying, not only are you written in the palm of my hands, right, but I'm also a wall of protection around you. Why? Because you belong to Jesus. Would you agree that Jesus takes really good care of what belongs to him? Well, then why, God, why do I go through a trial, Pastor? Why do I have these trials in my life? God never says you'd be trial free. He just said he's always with you. And you're written in his palms. And he's a wall of protection. Remember the disciples in the boat when it was really stormy? Remember Jesus was right there and he says, where's your faith? And then he tells the storm to calm down. You see, we go through storms in our lives and at some point Jesus is gonna say, stop it, storm, calm down. At some point, the devil wants you to think that storm's gonna be forever. I'm just telling you right now, God is gonna calm that storm down. In the meantime, what's the, what's the solution? Jesus says, where's your faith? Have faith in him. He's the one that calms storms down, right? right? So we gotta keep in mind, I, I just wrote down Terry's version of Isaiah 49. This is my version, so don't try to look it up. You may be going through tough stuff, but tough stuff doesn't have you because God has you. You're in the palm of his hands. Tough stuff doesn't mean the world has you. Tough stuff just means you're going through something tough. Keep it in the right category, okay? Do you know that tough stuff in your life produces perseverance and strength? All of us have, go through, maybe you're going through tough stuff right now. I want you to know perseverance and endurance is growing even though it doesn't feel good, right? Do you know that there's other things down the road, bigger things that God needs you to accomplish and do for the kingdom, but he needs you strong for that? Sometimes he allows things. You know that nothing sneaks by God and the devil goes, I got Terry, I got Lisa. No, God allows everything. Why? There, God always ties up the loose ends in the end because he writes the last sentence in the chapter of that situation. Amen? In the process, you're, you're growing. Your faith is increasing. Your endurance is you're getting stronger. Don't get discouraged by what you see. Keep your minds focused on the Lord. Amen? That's being a disciple, keeping your eyes on Jesus. So the book of Isaiah, especially if you, if you want to you read, uh, read a book that will encourage you about, especially if you've kind of drifted away from God. You ever, anyone ever drifted away from the Lord just a little bit? You drifted away? Read Isaiah, man, I'm telling you, because it's all about God's people drifting away right? And then God, right? Because God's about uh, bringing back. He wa he's about his kids coming back and he brings them back and reestablishes them. That's what God's heart is. He's all about bringing back his kids and reestablishing them. And that's super good news for us. Amen. Because some of us here, we've drifted or walked away and we're so thankful that the Lord desires to restore us to himself. So here's why God is so in love with you. If you're wondering, why is God so in love with me? Well, check it out. He tells us in Jeremiah 1, 5, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I want to leave that for, there for a second. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Isn't that amazing? Before God even made you in the womb, he already knew you. Powerful. It's also a scripture that stops any type, of, any type of discussion on abortion. Are you with me? You cannot be a Christian and support abortion because God tells you he had thoughts about you before he even deformed you in the womb. So you are valuable to God because he made you. Why did he make me? I always thought when I, was, um, when I was in high school, I didn't like the way I was made. I was 6'5", I weighed 167. Some of you try to picture that. I was a beanpole, I had a lot of good nicknames. Splinter, Wheat Thin, Window Pane was my favorite. Okay, because you could see right through me. All right, my brother was horrible, horrible to me. I always told him, when I get bigger, I'm going to get you. He became a cop, and I'm a pastor. That's a problem. It's a problem. I'm just telling you, I didn't like the way I looked. I, God, why would you make me this way? Even though I had gifts to throw football, I had all, all the other stuff. I used to have good hair. 
If you laugh, that's rude, actually rude. I, just, I was testing you. You failed the test. Some of you failed it, okay? I'm just telling you, God formed me exactly how he wanted me, amen? The devil wants to steal your identity. If you would change this, you'll, you'll fit in. If you do this, you'll fit in. You already fit in. You fit in when Jesus died on the cross. When his blood was spilt for you, you fit in. Don't let the enemy try to pull you out. Tweak you. And it's like that little game a little kid has, the little stars in the blocks. You try to shove the right one back in. And he wants to change you to shove you back in. You, there's no taking out and putting back in. You fit in. Just how you are. Now listen, well, I got this issue, Pastor. Of course, Jesus won't let you stay that way because he's all about healing and changing us. Right? That's totally different. I'm talking about your identity. You fit in because you're valuable to God. Ephesians 2.10 says this, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ for good works, which God prepared beforehand, beforehand that we should walk in them. Listen, God has created you for good works from the very beginning. You say, well, what are those, Pastor? Right? What are, I was talking to Mary today. I said, Mary, how's your week going? Where's Mary at? There's Mary. I said, I said how's your week going? I said, what's God stirring up in your heart? Well, because she's retired. Do you know when you retire, you're not finished, you're just starting another chapter? I said, what's God stirring up in your heart? Good works. I said, what's one? She didn't tell me good works, but that's what it is. I said, what, what's God doing in your heart? I go online and I buy baby clothes um, that are used. I, I fix them, wash them, hem them, and then I put them back on to sell them really cheap for mommies that, that can't afford them. And she just does this. Are you with me? You were created for good works. Everybody say amen to that. You have an identity and a purpose. There's, the devil wants you to feel hopeless and discouraged. What good are you, Terry? Right? What good are you? He wants the world system to define us. I'm going to talk about that. Right? So God's value system is he made you, he's crazy about you, and he loves you, and he's got a purpose that's good. Amen? All right, here's society's value system. We've got to get this right as a disciple. Okay, number one, or A, I think I have them letters. Personal, base, the, uh, the world wants to run you through its uh, value system. A is personal achievement and success, beauty and appearance, wealth and status, education, talent, and personality, right? I'm gonna just going to tell you, as I wrote down some key things, the enemy trips up a lot of disciples with is this, okay? Because here's what this would look like. If I run myself through A through G, Okay, I might come up with a number five. We do scales from one to 10, right? So let's use the 10 as the best. I come up with a number five. I'm just average at best. So when the Lord asked me to do something, to be a disciple, I've said this before. One of my elders had to correct me. When I first started the church, right, I would run myself, am I equipped, am I, am I value, am I, am I good enough to do what God's called me to do? Well, if you don't know who you are, you'll say no to what God wants you to do. And I'd say, Lord, pick someone else, someone smarter. Are you with me? I had run myself through the value system of what it takes to be a pastor, and I was disqualifying myself, even though others were cheering me up, because sometimes we can be the hardest on ourselves. Others said, Pastor, you're the one we prayed. We not, didn't matter how many times they told me. I ran myself through a value system of the world, and I came out not looking so good. God had to heal my thinking, right? The world wants to devalue you, Right? When I say world, I'm talking about our enemy. God says we have an enemy. Right? Let's just say the devil. Everybody say devil. Not a scary word because we have authority over the devil. Right? I'm just telling you, he wants to pin things and he uses other people. He'll use good people. You know, even Christians mess up. Peter messed up. He said something he shouldn't have said. Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. Because right? he knew that Satan had actually whispered to Peter and Peter repeated it, not knowing. Right? He got checked. We can all mess up at times, but... We only are identified by Jesus Christ, and our value system comes from what God says about us. And it's hard. You gotta, listen, God's rewiring our thinking today. We only need to be concerned about the things that he says about us. Amen? This week, you're going to go out of here. I, I promise. Watch what will happen. The enemy will try. You're going to be aware now because, remember, we're in training mode. That's what's happening. God's training us. You're going to hear something about you from a friend or a neighbor online, and you're going to be checked are you going to believe what they said or are you going to believe what he says? Because we got, a, we, got, we got an option. We have options to choose. Amen? So those are those. So the worldview is tough. The devil wants us to run ourselves through the, the devil's value system. Okay? So here's four ways. Also, the world creates poor self-image in people. Right? Self-image. Inferiority. Not quite as good. Rejection. But didn't get the promotion. 
didn't get invited to the party. Raise your hand. Anyone ever not get invited to a party? Doesn't feel good, does it? Don't base your feelings off what God says because that's what happens. A lot of times we'll base our feelings off, our, our identity based off a of feeling. It's a bad decision. That's our flesh. Unworthiness or comparison. I compare myself right to this person or this church or this job or that. Those are all identity killers. The devil wants you to run yourself through that filter. I'm about to show you God's filter about you in just, in just a minute, okay? These are God's things. I hope you're ready to be encouraged because here's God's filter and he wants you running your thoughts about you about how you see yourself through what he's, how he sees you and what he says about you. is this. First one is, you are loved. It's in Romans. I'm going to go through this quick so you may not get them. You can take a picture. You are loved in Romans. I encourage you to, to read these over yourself, right? You're training yourself to think like Jesus thinks. That's what happens when you, when you say scripture over yourself, okay? So you are loved in Romans. You are accepted, Romans 15. You are perfected in Christ, Romans, Matthew 5. You are complete in Christ. You're enough. You don't need to get this to be enough. You're complete in Christ. You are redeemed. He purchased you, and you are, you, are, uh, you are made valuable and precious in God's sight. I think I've got some more. I think we had to put them on the second slide. You are uniquely designed. God made you perfect. You don't need to change yourself. You have a purpose and a destiny, Isaiah, right, and Jeremiah. You have been given an assignment. God assi has an assignment for your life. You are continually sustained by God. I mean, you, got, you don't need your strength because God's going to give you strength. Amen? You ever say, I'm worn out? That's okay. God's got strength for you. Okay? You are continually sustained by God. You are uh, accompanied, uh, accompanied by God. Sorry. And then you are God's responsibility. God's going to take care of you. Isn't that good that you're not your own responsibility, that you're actually God's responsibility? And that's security. That, makes, that should make you feel good. Is that it, Ryan? I think it is. Okay, there you go. Those are God's value systems, how he feels towards us. Amen? What if we spoke that out loud? Listen, we, we say scriptures out loud because I'm going to make my mind and my heart believe what I say out loud. There's power in your words. I want to tell you, read scripture out loud and read them over yourself. Come into agreement with what God says, his thoughts, thoughts about you. So you, I want to say this, you are valuable because of the purchaser who purchased you. Think about this, the purchaser, redeemed mean he bought. On the cross, he bought you. All right, and here's the scripture for us, 1 Corinthians. It says this, or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? Everybody, everybody understand this, the Holy Spirit is in you. You're a temple, that means you carry the person of the Holy Spirit in you, okay? Whom you have from God who... Holy Spirit was sent from God into us when we got saved, and you are not of your own. For we were bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. You ever hear someone say, it's my body? Have you accidentally, have you said that sometimes too? It's my body. No, what God just say? You're his body, right? He purchased you, right? Purchased you. God's just a little bit, I would say, territorial. You ever, you ever worked really hard for something? and you bought it, and then someone stole it. You ever had something stole from you? It's like, oh, God paid a big price for you. He, he has a problem with the enemy trying to steal from him. He has a problem the enemy wants to take you from him. Here's another way you're valuable. It's in 1 Peter. You're valuable because of the price that was paid, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold, from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ. You were purchased with the blood. It wasn't regular money. It was supernatural. And Paul is addressing the Corinthians here. He's reminding them that you were bought with Jesus' blood. Okay? And no one could have paid more. That's the ultimate payment for us. Would you agree with that? Ultimate payment. And I would say this as we close. You are valuable because of the divine purpose Everybody say divine. God has a divine purpose, a, a purpose for you. A divine purpose. It's in Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. That's your divine purpose. God has thoughts about you. They're valuable thoughts. Ones with a, a purpose, a divine purpose. And you're valuable also because of the people that only you can touch. See, God's going to bring people across my wife's plate and her, across her life in the week, and she's going to be able to touch and speak into their life 
and I can't. Like this past week, she went to the jail and she spoke to, uh, to, for the ladies in jail and actually prayed over them and into them. And they were, she came back, she was so excited what God did in the, in the jail, right? I can't do that because she's talking to the women in jail. There's things that only you can do. And we see this in Jeremiah 1.5. God says, I knew you before I formed you in your mother's womb. Before you were born, I set you apart and appointed you as my prophet to the nations. God, what do prophets do? They speak God's heart. God's created you to speak his heart towards others. Amen? And then the last one is this. It's in John 4, 4. You have potential that you don't even know about. Do you know that there's potential in you that you don't even know about? But you belong to God, my dear children. You have already won a victory over those people. Because the, people, because the spirit who lives in you is greater than the spirit who lives in the world. The potential of the Holy Spirit gives you power that you don't even know you have yet. We may understand, but you're going to do things in your life ahead that you're like, how did I do that? God just told you. He's put his Holy Spirit in you. There's potential in you to do great things for the kingdom. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you love us and that we're defined by your value system. Father, would you, in this training series you have us in to be disciples, help us see us clearly how you see us, to be who you've called us to be, that we are uniquely made with the divine purpose of sharing your gospel with others and then walking alongside other Christians, encouraging them and discipling them. We thank you for your promises in our life, Lord. If you're here today, Jesus paid a huge price for you. If you don't know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, I want to encourage you today, don't waste another day. Don't be just a follower. Be a follower and a disciple that has surrendered to God. God is waiting for you to ask him into your heart, for you to surrender your life to him. If that's you, you've never done that, you can slip your hand up right now and say, Lord, I want to ask you into my heart today. Anyone today, you've never asked Jesus into your heart. Maybe you're a disciple, but you've drifted away from the Lord, and you're here right now, and you know the Holy Spirit's pulling you back to recommit your life back to the Lord. If you've never recommitted your life, and God just saying, he's not going to charge, I want you to recommit. It's time for you to get back into the game of being a, my disciple. Just slip your hand up and say, yes, today I want to recommit my life to the Lord. I recognize maybe I have drifted away just a little bit. Anyone today? Father, we just thank you so much for your goodness. We thank you for your love over us. Father, Lord, I pray that you would be with us this week, that everything we say and do would glorify you. God is to be your disciples that follow you and emulate you. In your name we pray, amen. Hey, we're going to get back into worship. Let's just worship the Lord as we close this out. Prayer team's coming up front. If you need prayer, you've got something big coming up or whatever it might be, let us pray with you, amen? Let's get back into worship. You give you are love, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope, you restore every heart that is broken. Shout your praise. 
church, we pour our praise out to you. You are the only one worthy of our praise, the only one worthy of our attention. Father, you're our purpose. You made us for a reason to serve you and to share the gospel of you with other people and disciple other people. Give us strength, Lord, to do what you've called us to do. In your name we pray. Let's give God a clap of praise for his goodness. Amen. So good. So glad you guys are all here today. Got a couple announcements before we dismiss. If this is your first time here, super excited you're here. If you would, if you fill out a communication card right in front of you and then drop into the tithe and offering boxes that are in the hallway right there. We're so glad you're here. Also, we have Forge. That's our men's ministry. This Thursday, we're actually going to be meeting at Pastor Amy's house. Okay, Pat, we'll have that online, but we're going to be building, we're going to have a float in the Christmas parade this year. It's going to be awesome. I'll just give you a little hint. You can see our float from 15 miles away. Not, I'm not lying. For real, 15 miles away. Okay, we're going big. Anyway, it's going to be fun. I just want to encourage you. That starts at 6 o'clock. We're going to have food. We're going to be building these giant stars. We need your help. If you're a dude, could use you. Okay. Also, Lifeway Thanksgiving meal is right after church today. We're going to have a great time. Remember, we brought, we have tons of food for everybody to stay and eat, for everybody. We're going to have extra for everybody to stay, okay? It's going to be a lot of fun, hanging out and eating with my friends, all right? And then we have one more thing. We just had Veterans Day, uh, Saturday, super important. We want to honor those veterans. We actually have a video as we want to honor you. There are sons and daughters our mothers and fathers, our grandparents, neighbors, and friends. They served in a thousand different ways in places spanning the globe, watching, waiting, and ready at a moment's notice to give what was asked of them. So now we pause to express our gratitude and love toward those who served. Each swore a sacred oath to protect, and each bravely stood in our place around the world, all so that we could stand secure in the land of the free. Words like sacrifice, honor, Commitment, integrity, bravery, and courage hardly scratch the surface of our gratitude for their service. While our words fail against the enormity of expressing our thanks for all you've done, we still raise our voices and honor you in our hearts, which are filled with the deepest kind of gratitude. To all of you, we pause to say, God bless you. And thank you for your service. I know we have many that have served. Would you, we have a little gift for you. If you served, would you raise your hand up high? If you served, go ahead and we'll pass that gift out. We have uh, some that have to, keep your hand raised up so we know where to take them. Right over here. We're so thankful those that served. Eric's over there. Let me pray us out. Father, we thank you for today. We give you glory and praise, Lord. Guide us, Father, as we go out this week to be your disciple, Father, Lord. And I pray over this food. Pray uh, that you'd bless those that made it, and I pray that we'd have a great fellowship as, uh, as we eat a meal together. In your name we pray. Amen. Whoever finds God, we'll see you. Oh,